Hello everyone and uh, welcome to um, this month's webinar, Keyshot webinar. In this uh, uh, webinar we'll be covering uh, rendering uh, of jewelry with a focus um, on, uh, on rings. Uh, my name is uh, Dries Revoort. I'm a product specialist at Luxion based in the Denmark office in Aarhus. So before we begin, this entire session will be recorded and the presentation that I'm about to give will also be available uh, as well as the, the any key shot scenes and models uh, will also be put on the on the webinar page of our website. The computer I'm using at the moment to do the demonstration is using a dual uh, Intel Xeon CPU with a total of uh, 32 threads and for those who are familiar with our uh, camera uh, benchmark scene I am getting around 185 uh, frames per second so that gives you an idea of uh, uh, of the, the the performance of my of my machine uh, if you if you have questions during the presentation or the the hands-on demonstration you are free to enter them in the questions section of the <clears throat> excuse me of the the go to uh, uh, webinar uh, window um, during this presentation I will be showing some features and I will try to call out whenever um, this is uh, a pro feature So let's uh, get ahead. So there's a number of topics I like to cover and uh, for jewelry it's uh, an, a nice topic to touch on the various aspects of Keyshot. So first I like to discuss a bit uh, the anatomy of a jewelry shot, what makes a jewelry shot interesting, uh, what's, w w what are the things to look for, and and then we proceed on how to approach uh, a specific uh, look uh, in in Keyshot. So I will I will be covering uh, model best practices, uh, then material best practices, lighting, and camera best practices. And this this uh, structure kind of follows the typical uh, workflow in the uh, in the Keyshot project. Lastly, I'll also tackle some uh, post-processing in Photoshop and show you how to use render layers and passes to enhance uh, your images. And I'll try to do this uh, with a hands-on demonstration where I'll guide you through an entire project from import to finish. And if time permits, um, we'll have some Q&A uh, at the end with the remaining time. So, what uh, what composes a jewelry shot? So I've put a couple of examples here. Um, so these are a number of higher end uh, jewelry manufacturers and I've put some images from a select few of them uh, on this page. So you'll see that there's a there's a quite a big uh, range of of uh, of looks that these manufacturers are going for. You can see that some, like this one from Tiffany, are using uh, sharp shadows. This one from Piaget is using more diffuse shadows and and has caustics as well. Um, so basically each each manufacturer has a, a, a unique style effectively so um, you will see that some have softer reflections, more diffuse, uh, some have very contrasting reflections like this one from Tiffany where you have a very big uh, a large contrast in bright and dark. 
Uh, some are natural, some are idealized. So, for instance, this one from uh, from Bucciolati, and I'm <laughs> I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this this right. Uh, this is kind of a very natural shoot where you actually see the imperfections uh, in the stones in the images. So the short of it is that there is no one single look for jewelry and that's mostly because jewelry is yeah is emotion and the message that the manufacturer is trying to convey will dictate the style so whatever style I will go, I will be going for in the hands on demonstration is not the definitive way of of doing a, a jewelry shot but it's just one of many ways that you can uh, uh, approach it so I like to stress that like for any rendering but for uh, jewelry in particular where you have uh, metals and gemstones that model materials and lighting are equally important and they all contribute to the rendering so this is probably the most important equation uh, for for today model plus materials plus lightning lighting make the make the rendering and all of these aspects are equally important and that's why I will be tackling them uh, individually so what are the best practices when working with models um, as a ground as a ground rule uh, the well the, a well-prepared model is going to be the best foundation and that means uh, that if you have clearances for for gemstones or holes in the shank like it would be in a in a in a real in a in a real life manufactured ring that will give you the best results uh, in key shot uh, also whenever you can do fillets around sharp edges on your metal parts that will give you a smoothest appearance um, in in key shot so but that's not always practical sometimes you cannot prepare a model in that way and then key shot provides a few features um, to improve your workflow and I will be going over those features uh, in hands-on demonstration I will be showing how you can use rounded edges and an option in the gem material uh, to ignore intersecting geometry to basically uh, simulate as if the 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 geometry was properly mo uh, modeled so this is a very brief presentation and I will be going over this pretty quickly because I want to uh, move on to the, uh, the yeah the demonstration as fast as I can so for materials, uh, I just like to highlight um, how to achieve accurate metals and gemstones. So in Keyshot 7, we have introduced a, a measured material type. If you look here on the on the right, um, it used to be in Keyshot 6 and prior where metal was just defined by a color, but now there's a metal type selection where you can actually set it to measured and then you can select from a drop down from a number of uh, of popular or common metals and these will provide the best results um, if you're working with with products where metals are are yeah a very important component and that's definitely the case for for jewelry So gemstones, as a rule of thumb, uh, the best starting point is using the, the gemstones uh, folder in the Keyshot uh, material library. Uh, that's a good starting point because those materials have the correct, the physically correct color, the correct refractive index, and the correct uh, Abbey number. So I will this uh, explain these. Uh, these uh, optical properties uh, in the next slide so color and transparency distance they kind of work in unison so the color uh, 
sorry, the transparency distance is basically the distance inside the model where this color is achieved. Uh, for diamonds, the color is yeah, typically typically white. Diamonds are, are colorless gemstones. Uh, the refractive index defines how much light is bent, meaning refractive when uh, it enters a material. Uh, if I go back to this slide, refractive index uh, can be found here in the in the gem material. Uh, this is a property that's available for for any uh, uh, for for many materials in Keyshot like plastics, uh, gem, dielectric, and many m many others. Uh, again, for diamonds, since diamond is the most common uh, gemstone material, this would be a value around 2.42, uh, 2.418 uh, to be exact. Then the Abbey number which you can find here. The Abbey number is a measure for a material's dispersion and dispersion is the separation of uh, white light into the, the colors of the spectrum. Uh, if you enter a high Abbey number you will, you will get uh, low dispersion meaning uh, less colors. Uh, for, for diamond uh, Diamond typically has an Abbey number of uh, 55. I like to note though that in the library uh, the gemstone diamond material has an Abbey number of 30 and that's been done on purpose to get more of those dispersed colors. And if I go back to these first slides then you can see it's pretty subtle but uh, the Abbey number will cause some colors, colored facets inside those gemstones and I think it's also best to use it uh, in moderation and to not overdo it and I will show that in the hands-on demonstration as well. Uh, I've, I've also put a link here to a website which is a very nice resource if you uh, are looking for exact uh, values. Uh, let me just um, open this one. Uh, yes. There we go. So this website, refractiveindex.info, is a very good resource if you're looking for those uh, exact uh, refractive index values. And if you select 3D shelf and then the crystals book, you will find some uh, some common gemstone materials like zap like sapphire, and you can use these. Uh, refractive index values inside Keyshot to get the, the most accurate behavior. Um, yeah, I put this slide in here, rea reality versus desirability, just to stress the fact that what looks best to you is not necessarily the most realistic. Uh, this goes back to this point where we use in the library 30 for the gemstone diamond. Um, the best looking image in your eyes is not necessarily what is physically most accurate. And that's also something to keep in mind that it's, I think it's okay to uh, change the parameters or change the color uh, so that you can achieve the best looking image. So about lighting, um, when rendering jewelry, your starting point is uh, probably going to be um, a studio environment. And if you look here on the right, I have uh, an image of the uh, Keyshot environments library. And if you go down in, into this studio folder, you will find a number of uh, studio environments that will give you uh, a pretty good starting point 
uh, for your jewelry rendering. And in particular, this three pan, uh, panels tilted 4K one uh, generally works quite well. Let me close this one. Generally it works quite well for uh, to quickly quit this service. So this particular uh, environment works really well if you're uh, doing doing jewelry. It has this nice contrast uh, like I showed in the Tiffany picture between this uh, bright white panel and the black background and then a couple of mid gray tones as well. Um, so you should really try to avoid HDRIs uh, which have uh, color in them and that's typically most of the yeah the HDRIs we have in the interior group. Uh, those have uh, color and very sharp details which are mostly well, undesirable for a jewelry rendering. Uh, I'll show you how you can still use them by desaturating and blurring them uh, in the HRI editor, which is a pro feature. Uh, so to that point, uh, you can use the HRI editor to make custom uh, environments. Uh, you will also notice that the studio environments all have uh, basically uh, pins set up which you can manipulate, move, uh, adjust uh, to your liking. And I also mentioned that uh, I like to use a white background for uh, jewelry rendering because it's the most flexible uh, in post-processing when working with layers uh, in Photoshop. Uh, as a uh, complementary to HRI lighting, you can use physical lights um, and I'll show how to use them to enhance uh, shadows. So physical lights are basically a material, a light material you apply to your geometry. And we have point IS and area lights. And I've tried to show an example where I use uh, a point and an area light. So caustics, um, caustics are a setting in the the lighting tab in Keyshot. Caustics are light focused by reflective and refractive surfaces. So if I go all the way back to this image here, you can see these light patterns uh, on the ground plane and these are th these are basically caustics focused light uh, uh, caused by these by reflections of these metal surfaces. Uh, not all of not all images have them. Uh, I can there are, for instance, no caustics in this uh, Tiffany image. So it's mostly a matter of personal taste uh, and also performance uh, because they will uh, the rendering will be faster if you if you disable them. But they can actually help to accentuate the refraction and dispersion in your gems and uh, the, the reflection from, from your metals. So camera, uh, some considerations about uh, best practices for working with cameras. Uh, basically we separate um, perspective and orthographic lenses. Uh, orthographic lenses uh, have no perspective but they can be useful when positioning geometry uh, especially when you enable the ground grid uh, where you can, it's quite helpful when aligning geometry to the ground. But I will show this uh, in a few minutes as well. So per perspective lens, that should basically be the lens type used for your final shots. And what you're trying to do with geometry, with, with, sorry, with jewelry, is basically simulating a, mi a, a macro photography shot where you go really close up to your uh, up to your jewelry piece. Uh, as a focal length, which is defined here in lens settings, uh, anything between 50 to uh, 50 and 100 millimeter uh, would be appropriate for a, for a jewelry shot. So 
one setting uh, in the camera tab is depth of field. So if I go back uh, down in the, the camera settings, there's this checkbox for depth of field. And depth of field allows you to simulate uh, a focus range. So uh, depth of field is the focus range or the sharpness in your image. Um, so these are basically some some rules of thumb uh, that are put here as a reference. But if you have a large depth of field, that means you have a deep focus, and it means a large area in your image is in focus. And on the opposite, small depth of field uh, is a shallow focus where only a tiny portion of the image will be in focus. Um, the strength, and this has dropped a bit out of this uh, screenshot, uh, the strength is controlled with the f-stop uh, slider uh, and that's an analogous to a real-life camera uh, so the larger the f-stop value is the smaller the aperture of a real camera that means the uh, basically the lens yeah, the opening and so larger f-stop will lead to a deeper focus to a larger uh, depth of field so more uh, more more portions of your image uh, in focus. So you will notice that when you're working with macro shots or uh, basically when your ring is filling the entire uh, real-time viewing key shot, you will notice that a very high f-stop value is required uh, to get an acceptable sharpness level. And KeyShot can actually, because it's a, a virtual camera, can achieve uh, a much higher f-stop than a real camera can. So it's no problem to use an f-stop value of like 100. So in that way, KeyShot is uh, much more flexible than, than, than traditional photography. So one feature uh, that's also very powerful is Studios, which is also a KeyShot Pro feature. Uh, this allows you to tie together uh, model sets, uh, camera, a camera and environment, and, and also multi-materials. So this allows you to basically have a custom environment for each, for each camera. And for those who come from KeyShot 6, Studios are basically the, the KeyShot 7 replacement uh, for few sets in KeyShot 6. Uh, but they go much uh, further beyond few sets. They are actually, yeah, uh, a quite powerful productive tool and I will show you, I'll try to show you a workflow uh, for that as well. Uh, finally, uh, some notes on post-processing in Photoshop and how that relates to the KeyShot features. So we have uh, output for render layers and passes in KeyShot Pro. Uh, render layers allow you to separate gems and metal, for instance and render layers will be rendered as transparent images together with the final uh, full render. Uh, we have render passes and in KeyShot 7 we have added a number of new ones and the one I like to mention for uh, jewelry rendering are ref uh, reflection, refraction, uh, shadow, ambient occlusion and caustics and I will show you how you can use those in Photoshop to enhance uh, aspects of your image. You can also add those, uh, all these render layers and passes to a PSD file, so you don't have to, to merge images manually, which is a very nice uh, workflow enhancement. Um, you can output third to 32 bit images. This can also be useful for uh, jewelry because it gives some more flexibility in, in for instance, Photoshop. Um, you, you keep all the color information. Uh, the supported formats are EXR, TIFF, 32-bit, PSD, 32-bit. Um, I'm not sure I will be able to cover this, but I just want to put this here as a reference. We have some other tutorials uh, that cover this, uh, this topic as well. So, yeah, next up, a hands-on demonstration. So I will use a ring model that was 
provided to us by Simply Rhino Limited, which is a Rhino and Keyshot reseller uh, based in the UK. And they were kind enough to provide this model that we can also share it with you afterwards. So the model in question is a Rhino model. Uh, it's a fairly simple uh, ring, but it has some nice details. So let me expand this perspective view. So when I talked about model preparation, um, this ring is actually a good example of, of a fairly well prepared uh, model. So I have these layers uh, and I will hide the large gem, gemstone. You can see that this model actually has the uh, as a whole for the for the the main the the main stone. And this is what you would typically find on the real ring as well. So if I hide the, the small gemstones as well, you will see that there are proper clearances uh, to basically fit the the gemstones. And this is uh, this is uh, what what will give you the best results uh, in Keyshot as well. So let me show those again. Uh, another important thing um, before exporting uh, to Keyshot or importing in Keyshot is to check uh, the tessellation, at least when I'm using the, the, the plugin uh, in, in Rhino. So I can do this in Rhino in the tools, options, and mesh. So this is going to be different for every uh, application, but it's a good idea to at least get the the, the right tessellation before you export uh, to to Keyshot. So these values work fine for me, and it looks decently smooth. So if I look at this curve, I got some nice uh, smooth curves. So now. Uh, with this geometry uh, ready to go, I can go to the Keyshot 7 plugin in Rhino and click to send it to Keyshot. So now my model has been transferred. You can see it keeps the same structure as I had in the in the Rhino model, with the separation in the large, small gemstones and the the metal surface. So uh, one thing I would like to mention for Rhino and yeah, this applies to other CAD applications as as well. If it's a NURBS model. Uh, uh, at least in the case of Rhino, those will be sent over as well. So even if the tessellation is not entirely optimal, uh, if it has NURBS uh, data, then you can right-click the model and retessellate. This is also a Keyshot Pro feature. But this allows me to even after the export to fine-tune the tessellation. So I can click apply and commit it like this. And let me just quickly change the environment to something more uh, interesting. With a bit more contrast. So I could, uh, you can see now that these edges of the metal part are still all very sharp and I could go uh, ahead and in Rhino blend uh, blend these edges and I could do this uh, manually uh, but that would take me a lot of time 
and it would be tough to do it on all on all edges but key shots uh, as a nice feature to basically simulate uh, rounded edges so and I will go ahead and f apply a precious uh, metal from the library first so I will go down to the material library into the metal folder and then look for precious and I will apply a gold a 24 karat uh, polished uh, gold and I simply drag and drop it onto the the, the metal ring and you can see uh, that now all these edges are sharp and you kind of lose uh, some yeah some definition in the shape but if I now just simply click on the on the object and if I have my scene tab open I can go uh, into this properties sub tab I can go down to uh, the rounded edges and if I now drag this slider and enter a value of for instance 0 0.15 you can now see that I get some nice rounded edges on my geometry and this is not changing the the actual geometry it's kind of a simulated effect but this is a very nice uh, and very quick way of uh, of making those of making those edges appear smooth in uh, in keyshot I will also press uh, C to uh, convert my background into uh, yeah, a white color. And let's also save the scene. So if I now, uh, double click on this uh, ring. I get the material that I applied from the library. You can see for this one that I'm using the, the measured, uh, measured preset. So all the library, all the metals from the library have, uh, have been updated to use this measured preset. And the benefit of these presets is that they will have uh, a more accurate uh, color and reflection behavior than using simply a color so I can convert this for instance to a color and try to achieve the gold using just uh, a color and looks like I'm pretty close now but you will notice that if you rotate this model for instance if I'm looking straight at this surface this looks uh, very yellow and not very much like gold would look in reality. Now, if I switch this back to measured, you will notice that you get uh, a much nicer uh, gradation in, in color. So the behavior of those measured measured uh, presets is is uh, is much more uh, uh, much more realistic. Uh, one thing I always do is add some slight roughness even if it's a polished uh, metal uh, so I will add a very small amount of roughness something like 0 0.005 just to break up those reflections a tiny bit so next up um, and let me actually change this material uh, to a titanium just to show another example uh, titanium I mean platinum so because that's also fairly common uh, jewelry metal and you will notice that you get a, s a very subtle but very nice gradation in, in, in color tones here as well so next up uh, I will be working on these uh, gemstones so I go into the material library and I will be look, looking for the gemstones folder there are a number of 
of very common uh, gemstone materials here. So we have uh, amethyst, uh, aquamarine, uh, but we also have diamond, gemstone diamond. And I will drag and drop this onto the small diamonds. And I want to use the same material for my large diamond as well, so I will hold shift and left click on the small diamond, which will copy the material, and then shift uh, and right click onto this large stone. And now the material is basically copy and pasted. So I'm going to rotate the view to look straight on it. Uh, one of the first things uh, that I also do when working with these with, uh, with gemstones is to make sure I have the, the right uh, lighting uh, set, uh, settings. So I go to the lighting tab and I will change this uh, to jewelry. We actually have a jewelry uh, preset. If I enable this then I'll, you will notice that the the gemstones brighten up a bit and that's because uh, this preset is using more ray bounces so if I make this a bit lower uh, or too low then you will notice uh, these gemstones are turning black so if you if you ever run into this issue where you get uh, black spots in your stones and you cannot get them to clear up. Uh, the first thing to check is definitely the lighting uh, tab and a good starting point is to check the jewelry, the jewelry preset and that will make sure that those uh, diamonds turn, turn bright. The jewelry preset, uh, like I mentioned, also has uh, Caustics enabled. I will disable this uh, for now to make it a bit faster. So this is a good starting point uh, for any jewelry shot. And for this ring, I actually want to. Um, I may want to use this version where it's kind of standing up. But I also want to create a version where it's laying down and I will use the model set uh, feature for this. So I will go back to the scene tab and this default model set I will right click. This is also a Keyshot Pro feature by the way. So I will right click this and rename it to call this upright upright and I will click this add model set button and then I will call this uh, lay down and I will make sure to link the materials because I want to use the same materials from from my original one and make sure that the ring the ring model is checked and now I have another uh, model set and now I can independently from the original one move this ring around so I will select the ring in the scene tree go to the position tab move tool and uh, I want to rotate this ring and basically pull it uh, down on, on the ground so I can try to get this right, uh, but I, I can see already that the perspective is kind of getting in the way and there's no clear indication of ground and that's why I will go into the uh, camera tab and I will add a camera which I call Ortho and in the lens settings for this new camera I will switch to orthographic which basically disables the perspective and I will enable ground grid uh, as well so now I get this 
uh, ground grid. And if I go to position orientation, uh, in standard views, I can change this to uh, right. And now I get this clear line, which is an indication of my ground. And I have no distortion of perspective. So now I can rotate my, my model. A uh, tip when, when rotating models is you can always uh, click the handle and then move your mouse out. If you move your mouse out, then you will get f more granular control over over your rotations. So I'll move this down. And I want it to be sitting completely flat on that surface. And it's okay for now if it's, if, if it's a tiny bit intersecting with the ground. So this looks good for now. And I will go ahead and create a, uh, or let me just switch back to perspective and switch off uh, ground grid. So now if I switch uh, between these model sets by double clicking, you can see that I now have two, two versions of, of one model basically. So next what I'm going to do is uh, sort of frame frame my shot before I, I find you my camera and environment. So I will be using uh, an HD format. So I'll go to the image tab, go to presets and then portrait and pick um, um, this one. No, uh, landscape, sorry. And use, uh, so now my my ratio is locked to an HD format. And this is my workflow. Uh, I like to uh, lock uh, my view first and then fine tune my environment. Um, so I will add a camera and I like to use a uh, focal length of 85. Right click center and fit models to make sure uh, my rotation center is uh, centered. So, so this looks uh, good enough for now. Um, I will also enable uh, depth of field. So if I check this, you'll notice uh, the complete image goes, uh, uh, yeah, blurs out. And that's because I have to basically select a focal point first. So I will click this select focal point button and then click somewhere on the, on the geometry. And you will notice uh, that there is a very, very shallow, a very, uh, yeah, a very shallow range of focus and a very shallow depth of field. And that's because the f-stop is, is, is one. And for this uh, small object that is filling so much of the view, that's definitely too, too low. So I can increase this value. And yeah, when working with depth of field, uh, Less is definitely more, so you do want to have it as a more subtle effect. Uh, when that's, uh, I'm feeling quite good with these settings, so I will make sure to save this camera. And I will also lock it so that I don't accidentally change it. I will also save the scene again, hitting Control S. And now I will uh, fine tune my, my environment. So basic adjustments uh, are to use these settings uh, for your selected environment. Uh, you select the environment and then you can uh, 
rotated to find uh, to tune those uh, reflections to your model so what you're looking for for jewelry rendering is uh, is a contrast between uh, bright bright panels uh, black and gray tones and this is a, a pretty nice um, yeah starting point uh, let me go into the environment tab and uh, drag in an, an, uh, an interior environment and show you why this is not optimal so I will drag uh, this bathroom environment into the uh, environment list which will add it as a second environment and now you can see that the colors inside this HDRI are coloring my metal as well so I actually lose definition of, of, of my, my metal like it's not clear whether this is silver platinum or gold uh, there's simply too much color and actually too much contrast in this environment as well uh, but I can go into the HDRI editor which is located uh, now in the environment tab so if I select this interior HDRI this interior environment and go to the HDRI editor I can actually select the the background and I can remove the saturation uh, and for jewelry shots you really want to remove everything so I will put this to zero percent and I can also blur the environment so I'll add a, a value of three and I can also lower the contrast and you do want to make sure to hit this uh, generate full resolution HDRI after having made made those changes this will create a high resolution version so now uh, this is uh, much more appropriate for a jewelry rendering uh, where the the colors have been uh, removed now I can use this as a base and actually uh, start adding that contrast again because that's that's definitely a bug so I can actually use this as a base and start adding pins on top of this adjustment so I can click this add pin button and this gets me into the uh, highlight mode for this newly added pin so now I can click anywhere on my model and this will add the highlight uh, right where, where I click I do like to work with rectangular shapes so I will change this to rectangular and actually I can change the size so independently for X and Y there's a lot more options uh, to fine-tune here uh, so but that's basically trial and error it will depend very much on your actual uh, yeah, geometry so I will add a bright pin here click done I will add another one and this one I will actually want to change into uh, a black pin and I will change the blend mode to alpha so now I can actually add a dark patch inside my my environment we'll also change this to uh, rectangular and maybe change the fall off on this one so in with the HRI editor and the, those pins and highlight function you can really paint the lighting uh, on, onto your model basically add a few more rectangular you can also make a half pin so that if you change the angle you can create a nice fall off across your model we'll 
regenerate this as well. Next step, what I will do is uh, control my, my ground and I will go to the edit menu, go to add geometry and add a, a ground plane. There are some changes we made here in Keyshot 7 that's going to be very nice for jewelry rendering. What you typically have with, uh, with a lot of jewelry shots is uh, a reflection on a white background. This was quite difficult to achieve in Keyshot 6, but with the ground material in Keyshot 7 is actually quite easy. So when you do this at, at geometry ground plane, it will add a ground plane object with the ground material, if I double click, uh, in the scene. So if I change the specular, the, the reflection color from black to white, um, there's a slight hint of reflection. Uh, but if you notice, there's this reflection contrast slider. Uh, let me change the reflective index to 2 as well. So if I increase the reflection contrast, you will see more of that reflection in that, in that uh, ground plane. So this allows you to get a clear reflection on a on a uh, on a on a white background. Uh, the option clip geometry below ground will make sure that any piece, any parts of the geometry that are intersecting the ground, uh, will not be rendered. So I actually want to make sure that I click this again because I know that my object was a tiny bit intersecting uh, the ground plane. So if you then add some roughness to the ground material as well, you get some nice uh, nice fall off in the in the reflection. So I want to make sure I'm saving. Like this. So one option that was added uh, as well uh, in Keyshot 7 uh, for ground shadows uh, is occlusion uh, ground shadows. So if I go to the environment tab down to ground and let me hide the ground plane first. Uh, if I check occlusion ground shadows, then you notice that I now get a contact shadow. And this is also typically uh, what you see in many jewelry renderings. Uh, the nice, the nice uh, thing about uh, these kind of shadows is that they are independent of of the lighting itself. So if I uh, these shadows are now only defined defined by the, by the proximity of the geometry to the ground. So you will notice if I move this model up and down that those shadows update. But if I, for instance, add another uh, if I would change this this uh, environment by changing the rotation, for instance, those will not update. I can then control the the shadow color by adjusting uh, the color of the ground shadows. So if I can tune how how dark those are. So I will disable it for now again and show my ground ground plane. And yeah. So not sure how we're doing on time, but I do want to show uh, layers and passes uh, to show you the potential of those in in post uh, in in Photoshop. So. Like I mentioned, I I will actually be using uh, render layers as well. So I will click on the metal part, and uh, in the scene in the scene tab with the metal ring selected, I will go to the render layer section and click on a create new render layer. I will call this layer metal, 
and then I will go to the uh, I want to select all the gemstones so I just click the gemstones group which will select all these parts create a new a new layer and call it gems and maybe I want the ground plane on an, uh, its own layer as well so I'll create another one and call it ground now with those layers uh, set up I click on the render button and I will define a resolution I will include all the render layers and I will include the uh, I won't include the caustics because I'm not rendering caustics now but I will include the reflection, refraction, shadow, ambient occlusion uh, maybe clown as well I will be rendering to a PSD format include alpha and I will add all those uh, layers and passes to the PSD and let me put this PSD file on the desktop and call it ring webinar so um, for quality I like to use uh, maximum samples of time let me just put this on a really high value um, just do it like this and let me render So the nice thing about max samples and max time is that it's a, a progressive uh, render mode. So it renders up the entire image, and when you're happy with the achieved quality, you can always uh, cancel it, or at least stop the render and still get the result back. So I will let this render for a couple more seconds, and when I'm happy with the result. I will just stop it and save and now it will actually uh, have output a PSD file so here it is let me open this in Photoshop So you can see now uh, the output from Keyshot is the the base rendering with the alpha with transparency, and then it all it automatically put all the render passes and the render layers into its own uh, folders. So if I show these, they are all uh, all available. So I have the ground on a separate layer, the gems are now on a separate layer, and the metal as well. So now I want to quickly show how I can use the reflection, uh, sorry, yeah, the reflection pass and the shadow pass to, to really uh, uh, enhance the, the the base image so maybe I want to put this on a color uh, background so I will add a new layer and move this uh, move this down and pick some key shot kind of blue and use a paint bucket to just fill this so now I have uh, basically my image on uh, on this ground plane but I actually want to use the render layers here so if I enable uh, the render layers and show the gems and the metal now I have uh, only uh, the geometry basically on, on the layer then I will um, 
show the reflection uh, reflection pass and basically this is uh, if I hide the layers again the reflection pass is basically a layer containing only uh, the reflection components of the rendering so whatever is uh, not reflecting anything with, will be completely black and if I show the render layers again select the reflection pass and change the um, the blend mode for the layer to something like screen you will now get uh, a reflection in that uh, in that colored background I will also show the shadow pass and I will select this pass and change this uh, blend mode to multiply so now if I toggle the shadow pass you can see that you can now rebuild um, rebuild the the model re rebuild the the ring on any uh, colored background so with these uh, especially the reflection the shadow pass are really powerful tools to yeah to to tweak the the rendering uh, without re-rendering uh, in Photoshop. I can also do the same for the uh, ambient occlusion pass, uh, which I will actually drag on top and then set it to multiply. So with the ambient occlusion pass, if you set it to multiply, you can really uh, accentuate crevices and corners uh, in your geometry. And so, if I wanted to boost this, um, or enhance this reflection even more, I could add something like a, uh, a curves, a curves uh, adjustment layer, and then tie it to this reflection, a uh, reflection pass, and then I could tweak the curves and enhance uh, the reflection that way. You could do the same with the shadow pass, add a curve adjustment there as well and make it apply to the shadow pass only. So I can really tweak tweak uh, the intensity of those shadows. So yeah, that's uh, uh, a very quick run through how to set up uh, a jewelry shot from start to finish. There's a lot more to say about this. Um, um, for those people who still have time, I, I think we can tackle some questions still. Do we have some questions? Hey, Dries, that was great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we do have one right there on uh, what you're showing. Kevin is asking, why do the gems look so muted and not bright, especially the small diamonds? Oh, that's probably because I didn't spend enough time actually tweaking the environment. Um, it's definitely possible to, um, to get those um, sparkling and let me just pick a scene that's already set up. Um, quickly quit this. Um, okay. So yeah, those how those diamonds look will definitely depend a lot on your on your uh, environment. So yeah, as a general uh, rule, I would say if your environment has uh, a few large uh, large white panels, those will kind of fill fill your yeah your gemstones. And if there's a lot of contrast and there's a few bright 
bright uh, pins they will also kind of uh, push these these colors into the into the diamond so yeah that that's definitely a matter of, of fine tuning and tweaking the pins and uh, finding the right balance between yeah the gemstones and and uh, and the metal Thanks, Therese. That makes complete sense. Um, and thanks, uh, Niamal. Uh, that's a good recommendation about uh, having some master key shot files for diamond jewelry uh, with, uh, with key shot. I think there is one in there. Um, and we'll, we'll provide some more from this, from this uh, uh, webinar. Yeah, and yeah. As Kurt uh, points out, you can always level up and make some adjustment adjustments in Photoshop, but as Dries showed, that environment is going to matter a whole lot. Um, yeah. Let's see, what else do we have here? Hey, Josh, there were a couple of questions up toward the top that uh, I marked, uh, some plug-in-based questions. Um, right. Um, Matrix 9, do we have a Matrix 9 plugin, which is a, a jewelry software? Uh, Kathy, thanks for that question. We don't have a plugin for that yet, um, but uh, you can import it into Matrix 9, uh, just like you would import into Rhino. And let's see, the plugin for, is the Rhino plugin for PC or Mac? There, we have a, Rhino plugin for both PC and Mac, and you can find that at keyshot.com slash plugins. Yes. Yeah, just realized what I didn't cover was the the physical lights. Uh, here's an example scene, and again, these scenes, I will prepare them, make them available for everyone to download. So here's a sphere that has uh, an area light applied that's been put in the distance with visible reflections unchecked, and you can use this area light to add these sharp shadows to your scene, if that's what you're looking for. Okay, great, great. Um, Jan has a question about the ground plane shadows. Um, yes, are the ground plane shadows and the in environment tabs ground shadows redundant should I always use either or and never both um, let me first pick this one yeah this one has kind of a special setup um, so the question is oh the question is are these redundant if you're using the ground plane yeah the ground plane shadows and the environment uh, ground shadows are those redundant should they both be used neither um, one not the other oh yeah actually if you so if you disable ground shadows you cannot enable occlusion ground shadows uh, but let me import uh, a ground plane again so now I imported a new ground plane now if I disable ground shadows that will still give me shadows from the ground plane material. So, long story short, this ground shadows checkbox uh, really only applies to the default uh, key shot ground when there's no geometry. Uh, so yeah, if you have a ground plane, that's, a, that's essentially redundant, yes. So if I now check, uncheck, that will basically give the same appearance. But uh, I usually just leave this on. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, hope that explains that, Jan. Um, Seth is asking about caustics, and the one example that you showed uh, had a really nice caustics in those. Do you have an example yeah. that has caustics, or can you show where that would be set up? Yeah, I can open this one again. And I'm just going to quickly um, hide this plane. 
and show and add another ground plane and I will actually change the material on this one to a diffuse because for caustics to really be visible you need a material to actually catch that light and a, diff a lighter diffuse plane is going to work well for that benefit of this is also that it's going to create a reflection in your metal so in this scene I actually have a sphere that's um, let me disable depth of field that's um, over here and this sphere has an area light diffuse material and those physical lights are going to be very nice uh, if you're working with with caustics so if I go to the lighting tab and just go down into the general lighting accordion and enable caustics you can see here already that I'm getting some nice uh, patterns um, for caustics I will mention that they are fastest for uh, point lights so let me change this area light to a point light and now I will have to increase the brightness so now you get these nice patterns uh, So yeah, caustics uh, will slow down the rendering somewhat, uh, but yeah, if they can definitely add some 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 interesting details, and if you then move around this geometry, you can sort of tweak tweak the extent of the caustics or the shape. So yeah, caustics definitely work best if you add um, a sphere and then apply a point light or an area light to it, and then you just uh, simply you'd simply enable enable caustics in the in the lighting tab. Uh, you can actually put caustics on the on the render pads as well, and then you get something quite similar as the as the reflection pass. So then you can uh, layer it, set the blend mode to screen, and then you can control uh, those caustics in Photoshop as well. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, great. Thank you very much. He says, perfect answer. Thank you. Okay, nice. <laughs> All right, I think that's about it. We will have this uh, we'll have this on the website and on YouTube uh, coming up here shortly. If you've registered, we'll send it out and let you know when those scenes and uh, the replay is available and if you have any questions or want to share your jewelry shots stop by the key shop forum share them there share them on uh, Twitter Instagram we'll uh, be watching for them we love to share your work too so uh, jump in and let us let us see what you guys are creating uh, would love to anything else trees yeah I think also jewelry since it's using all these new features like the new metal and um, a whole bunch of new material stuff uh, it's probably a good opportunity to go into the forum and check out the the render competition that's right definitely so you can maybe throw in some metallic paint details in there use some of those metals and 
I'd like to see some jewelry shots in there as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, thanks so, for uh, remembering that. So yeah, um, I know maybe it was a bit rushed on some of the details uh, because it's also a lot to cover. But yeah, if there's any questions, uh, you can always reach out to us. But uh, yeah, thanks for attending today, at least. See you next time.